Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing in an awesome guest today involved in creating a better tomorrow, not just for us, but for all our animal and pet friends out there. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Tristan Kalanias, who is the Chief Veterinary Officer and Deputy Director for Science Policy at the Food and Drug Administration. Center for Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Kalani has previously worked in various positions at FDA, including as uh, Deputy Chief of Staff to Commissioner Califf, uh, as well as an international policy analyst. Uh, and during his career at FDA, Dr. Kalani has been working on numerous initiatives, uh, including things like the Animal and Veterinary Innovation Agenda, uh, the topic of One Health, uh, the area of intentional genomic alterations in animals, as well as uh, zootechnical animal feed substances, among many other programs. Uh, at CVM. Uh, prior to joining FDA, Dr. Kalani has held positions in both the U.S. Senate and the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, he went to the Hill originally as a uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, Science and Technology Fellow uh, in Senator uh, Kirsten Gillibrand's office in New York and worked to help pass the, the Agriculture Act of 2014, also known as the Farm Bill Renewal. Uh, he also then went to work for uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, uh, first as a legislative assistant and then as her deputy uh, legislative director. And then that, while in that office worked on various themes, including disaster preparedness, climate resiliency, uh, emerging public health threats, as well as other very important topics. Uh, Dr. Kalani holds a, a bachelor's in political science, went on to get his uh, doctor of veterinary medicine degree from Louisiana State University, and then he did a master uh, of public administration from the University of Illinois. A lot of really important themes to get into today. Honored to have him with us, uh, Dr. Tristan Kalanias. Uh, welcome to our show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And you're right. There's a lot of meaty topics we can dive into today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, would love to start off, though, um, you know, as we typically do at, at the beginning, uh, just by you know, handing you the mic for a little bit, just to, to talk a little bit more about you. Would love to hear uh, everything from where you grew up, uh, why you got into veterinary medicine, and maybe if you could take us up to around 2010, because I think that's where, I think you were still working on your veterinary medicine degree when you started publishing on the theme of animal welfare and education. And I know this is a, a very important topic to you. It sort of goes throughout your career, but uh, take us back if you would a little bit and tell us your story. Yeah. And please call me, call me Tristan. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana and, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't really ever, you know, grow up thinking I wanted to be a, a veterinarian. So, um, you know, I started my undergrad at, at LSU, Louisiana State University um, in 2005. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, this is the um, this is around the same time that um, Louisiana was hit by Hurricane Katrina, which, you know, was really a, a catastrophic event of scope. Um, that I had never seen. You know, I grew up going through a number of hurricanes. I think Hurricane Andrew is one of my first memories. But, um, you know, the the level of destruction of Katrina was just um, immense. And it turned everything upside down. You know, much of LSU campus became uh, part of the disaster response. And, you know, I really had an urge to um, help in, in some way. And it was pretty difficult to get back into New Orleans, which was hardest hit. Um, not really due to the hurricane, but due to the subsequent breaches of the 17th Street Canal, the Industrial Canal, major levees that um, flooded, um, you know, a huge swath of the city. 
And you really had to be connected with some sort of relief uh, effort to be able to get back and access the city. And so through really chance, and I think it's a good reminder that uh, a lot of things in life are timing and opportunity, you know, I had a chance to work with um, veterinarians on the ground in New Orleans responding, you know, ranging from animal rescue to um, feeding in place to um, thinking about the safety of, of food and, and water provisions. And I, uh, you know, really fell head over heels in love with that type of work. I had never conceptualized that veterinarians could work in, in uh, a public sector and disaster response and really being on the ground to help a community rebuild. And I just knew that that's what I wanted to, to do. So I, I decided I wanted to go to veterinary school and, and I was perhaps not the average student since I had not grown up wanting to be a veterinarian and, and wasn't thinking of doing clinical practice. I really wanted to go to veterinary school and jump into public um, public service. Um, and so, you know, during my veterinary education, students have an opportunity to do externships where you get, you know, to spread your wings. And a lot of students might do an externship in a clinical practice uh, to, you know, spin their wills. I wanted to get some experience working on policy and, and I got a chance to extern with the American Veterinary Medical Association mm -hmm. um, and Welfare Division. And 2010 was a pretty important year. AVMA was putting more focus on animal welfare. Um, and so I had a chance to co-author the article you mentioned with another veterinary student, um, Jamie Sw Swoboda, um, really, you know, talking about given you know, the societal interest in animal welfare and that more people were looking to veterinarians for uh, a very science-based and uh, thoughtful approach to animal welfare, that, you know, there really was a time to discuss, should this be integrated more into the veterinary curriculum? And that was also the year that, you know, AVMA, uh, you know, moved to add animal welfare to the veterinarian's oath. So really part of that larger effort to have the profession discuss, how do we better integrate animal welfare, which is really integral to veterinary medicine, but maybe not explicitly called out and, and to have veterinarians step up to be really a judicious leader on this topic, which was getting a lot of interest with a lot of varied views. And I think it was just a, another reminder of how the breadth of veterinary medicine, you know, I had yep. gone from working, getting interested in disaster response to then thinking about, you know, large policies and, and how the veterinary profession as a whole thinks about animal welfare and and works that into uh, into their um, education and, and into the veterinarian's oath. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a couple years later in 2013, you're in Senator uh, Gillibrand's office at the time, uh, you write a, a piece in the, the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association entitled, uh, One Welfare, a Call to Develop Broader Framework of Thought and Action. And here now, I'll let you take you through us through this because we'll, we'll be talking about One Health in a little bit and, and the audience is a little familiar with that theme. You create this concept of One Welfare, which is basically saying, look, um, how we treat our animals, very important, but we don't normally think of sort of the, the various trade-offs uh, at both ends of the spectrum. No, we don't want wet markets, but at the same time, we can't raise every animal, you know, like a Kobe beef cow, whatever, you know, so there's different extremes here that not just impact cost, uh, but energy consumption, wildlife habitats, the environment yep. broadly. Talk about this theme. I think it's very important. Yeah. So, um, and I may step it back for a minute, but, you know, 2011 was the year that I graduated veterinary school. And it, it was, I think, one of the first years that I, I, I have really seen One Health starting to permeate into the veterinary education, the, the what's now called the World Organization of Animal Health, I think did a big event that, that year in 2011 on One Health. And, um, you know, having done an externship and was thinking about animal welfare, it seemed only natural to really, you know, write an article with one of my um, coworkers, um, Rosemary Early, who I now have the pleasure of working with at FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine. Our, our paths diverged for a long time, but have come back together, which is another benefit of working in this uh, small field. Um, it, you know, that that animal welfare was a complex topic and was important to think about it in a similar way to One Health, that it's interconnected, that you have to balance a number of things that just looking at a topic like animal welfare in a silo um, won't always yield the you know, a, a practical answer or the right answer or an answer that makes sense in the context of the bigger picture. And, and 
you know, it was a good opportunity to kind of think about that in, in context of, of One Health as that topic really began to flourish in those years, 2012, 2013, 2014, really uh, picking up of some steam to the topic of One Health. And I guess I should step back and say how I think about One Health is, you know, thinking, I really think about it as an approach, you know, how do you approach a problem or a policy issue where human health, animal health, and environmental health are interconnected? And how do you take a systems-based approach to that recognizes those connections and thinks about, you know, how those systems interact depending on the goal you have, you know, and how to either balance those interactions or understand those interactions, um, even if you're not balancing them um, equally to drive to the policy or public health or animal health solution that that you want to see. Mm -hmm. and, and continuing along that theme for a moment about, you know, your background, not just in the scientific front, but in in creating policy and public administration. Um, it was a couple of years later, um, I, I came across this letter. It's actually, you're mentioned in it. Uh, it's when you're in Senator Feinstein's office. I think Cory Booker is also, also in this. And you're you're writing to, at the time, Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, about, I guess, some misbranding that was going on in, in terms of the phrases you mainly raised, cage-free. Um, talk a little bit just about the experience, because this is, I know, is something else that's been very important with you. You know, we have... Once we're on the hill, we need to communicate the proper science because if we don't do that, then you know things don't get done. Ultimately, from from that perspective, um, say a few words about this because I know this is another very important piece of your journey prior to FDA. And I'm yeah, just to mention for the audience. Yeah, so I, I well, let me tell you how I ended up on the hill because I think you know I worked for Senator Feinstein, and one of the things she said a lot is you know everything's timing and opportunity, and I think my career path illustrates that a little bit. There wasn't necessarily some great plan, but, you know, I started my post veterinary career working with U.S. Department of Agriculture, um, yeah. Food Safety Inspection Service in North Carolina. And I spent a lot of time doing um, inspections of pork and, and poultry um, uh, production and processing facilities, which was really uh, excellent at hands-on work to really understand um, an important piece of the food production system and, and how, um, it's important to have an, an effective food safety system um, to uh, control um, pathogens and hazards um, in the food. But, you know, after doing that for a little while, you know, I really wanted to work at the policy level and um, at the American Veterinary Medical Association and Association for the Advancement of Science, ABMA AAAS, had a congressional fellowship opportunity for veterinarians. So I applied and was fortunate enough to get that and, you know, thought that I might want to go work for... Um, you know, my home state senator. But when I got when I got up there, um, you know, Senator Gillibrand had recently moved over from a from a House district um, to the Senate seat, and she was on the Agriculture Committee. And that was really interesting to me because the, it was around the time 2012 that the Ag Committee was working on the Farm Bill, which is the five year bill that the Ag Committee does that really sets agricultural policy and funding for many agricultural programs. For five years. So it was a it was a huge opportunity and decided I wanted to get placed in her office and get to work on the farm bill. And it was really rewarding. Um, lots of dairy, specialty crop interests, but also consumer interests, uh, uh, really important nutrition assistance programs for for New York. And, um, you know, the fellowship lasted a year and I had had the chance to coordinate on a number of those issues with uh, the California Senate offices because New York and California ag sectors had some similar overlap, especially crops, dairy production, and the farm bill hadn't gotten done. And um, a, a, a vacancy opened up in Senator Feinstein's office, and it was timing and opportunity that I had been working with them on, on many important similar issues in the farm bill that New York and California shared interest based on the type of agricultural production in the state. And I was um, in the right place at the right time to jump in and help Senator Feinstein finish the farm bill. But one of my one of my favorite things about working on the Hill is you never knew what, a, you know, the day was going to throw at you. And so while I immediately was working on the farm bill, one of the other first things that I got thrown in Senator Feinstein's office was work on reauthorization of the National Flood Insurance Program. And boy, did I had no expertise, no academic background in flood insurance. But, you know, certainly growing up in Louisiana and having, you know, started 
you know, my interest in this area really with Katrina, certainly interesting how some threads uh, re recombine. So, um, but I think one of the interesting things about being a veterinarian is you're really taught these meta skills about how to quickly think on your feet, how to approach an emergency patient, how to approach a, a population health um, emergent outbreak in a, you know, in a say cattle herd. And some of those same skills work to when someone says, Hey, national flood insurance is coming to this and it for in a few weeks, you're covering that for us. Like, <laughs> what are we going to do about that? And, you know, um, it was really a, a great experience. Um, I think what's interesting is that, you know, Senator Feinstein said on the agriprops subcommittee, which funds USDA, but also funds FDA. So that was my real opportunity to begin working closely with FDA. And I really fell in love with FDA's mission as an agency throughout those years. Um, I got to work with FDA on a number of topics ranging from um, cosmetics reform to antimicrobial resistance to food safety and um, really appreciated the agency's breadth, the agency's unique position with a public health focus, but still having a one health and animal health and an agricultural mission embedded in many parts of what the agency does. And, you know, after working in Senator Feinstein's office for a number of years, you know, there was no other choice for me, but, but FDA, I knew that's where I wanted to go to go next. So um, I, I just like to reflect on those things because, you know, you can try to create grand plans for your career, but at least in my experience, so much is timing and opportunity and discovering along the way, um, what motivates you and what drives you and, and grabbing opportunities when they come up. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned not knowing what the day might throw at you. And clearly uh, in this current role or multiple roles that you serve at FDA now, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's the case because, you know, the, the CVM has this mission statement of protecting human and animal health. Um, but, you know, what comes under that umbrella uh, drugs for all our companion animals and non-companion animals, uh, ensuring that our food is safe when our, our, uh, the food we're eating or the animals that we're eating uh, have drugs or food ingredients put in them and, and so forth, making sure food additives are safe. Um, talk about the position of chief veterinary officer. Talk about a day, a day that, you know, got thrown at you, I'm, whether it's a, hey, we have a, a, a an anti-cancer drug for cats or uh, something going into chickens that, you know, makes them fatter or something for a ferret or we're, we're a bird family. So I don't know if you have any cool bird stories, but <laughs> take us a little through your day, your day to day now, uh, just if you would. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that because during uh, veterinary school, I had a uh, course on animal emergency management, which was just meant to be a classroom course, but it coincided with the Deepwater Horizon oil spills. Mm -hmm. So I spent that course um, helping to, to wash and care for oil pelicans and, and other <laughs> wildlife birds. So th there is a connection there. But yeah, I mean, so the Center for Veterinary Medicine, as you said, has a real really broad remit. So animal drugs, um, animal food, animal devices, uh, certain animal cellular therapies, animal biotechnology. And, and I think that it's, it's a center where the human health and animal health issues constantly collide. Um, and this is a center that's really been doing and defining One Health for quite a long time. And, and so, you know, FDA had, had, you know, recruited on a chief medical officer position, you know, to really help pull important threads together on, on outbreaks and pandemic threats. And, you know, the commissioner and, and others and leadership at the time, you know, really thought given One Health and given the increase of these issues that, you know, straddle animal health and human health and agriculture and, and wildlife, um, there was a real need for a chief veterinary officer position to both help FDA be a leader in this and to really tap the deep expertise across CVM, the Center for Veterinary Medicine and with veterinarians, biologists, um, people with agricultural science backgrounds, geneticists, bioinformaticists, chemists, pharmacists, um, and bring that expertise to bear to these big meaty problems. And, um, you know, as several of them rose right away, you know, when, when I um, was fortunate enough to take this uh, position, you know, the agency and the center were, were dealing with uh, this issue of xylazine and approved um, animal drug um, that was being uh, abused, not for, for its real um, impact, but for its, you know, ability to potentially um, potentiate um, other controlled substances like fentanyl. Right. Um, and then I think even, even more compelling, 
Um, you know, this past spring, um, we identified um, highly pathogenic avian influenza, H5N1 had made a jump from um, uh, what it seems like wild birds into dairy cattle. Um, and certainly another issue where the need to take a one health approach and to work across sectors and, and boundaries was really urgent. So I think, you know, the position was created at a great time because the agency, I think, is facing more and more of these issues. And it really helps for the entire Center for Veterinary Medicine's expertise um, at solving these one health problems to be tapped and to be brought to the forefront and to be brought to bear against these challenges. Mm -hmm. And um, September 2023, you release the uh, the Animal and Veterinary Innovation Agenda, and you know that basically this breaks down to sort of four components: technologies and products, uh, regulatory um, dynamics, One Health, and then emerging health threats. And it was interesting because you know, as you know, a, a couple of years ago, I had Dr. Bumpus on the show talking about the uh, the Advancing Regulatory Science document FDA, which was 68 pages. Yours is only 17 pages long, but I there was so much stuff in these 17 pages, and we'll get to some of that. But talk a little bit about what went into putting this innovation agenda. We'll link to it uh, in the bio uh, and the show notes. But talk a little bit about because there's everything in here from diseases I've never heard of, like uh, blackhead disease, histomoniasis, to one health, to the genetic engineering issues. And so talk a little bit about the agenda, if you would. Yeah. So, I mean, this this is a document that really the entire center uh, worked on to put together. But, you know, I, I think it came out of us seeing what I, what I would say are two big, uh, big things. I think one, there is an incredible, I think, excitement and optimism of some new innovative technologies like gene editing or what we often refer to as intentional genomic alterations in animals. But gene editing has real applications across plants, animals, and, and humans. And FDA is like right in, in the middle of that, which is really interesting. Um, and so how do we get regulation right for these new and emerging fields and technologies and, and do it in a way that can support and spur innovation that's safe and, and effective and durable and trusted by the consumer? But then we've also got challenges. We've got both these One Health challenges of these issues like I've discussed, be it um, xylazine, be it um, H5N1. Um, and we've also got areas where we know there are really important unmet needs in veterinary medicine, in, in the animal industries. Um, and, you know, it may not be a new innovative technology that's needed to address that, um, but there are, you know, real issues that we need to resolve with why the system is not producing, um, you know, interventions to those areas. And some of those issues we're not alone on. If you think about some of the you know, economic pressures in spaces like infant formula or generic drugs, I think we have, or, you know, rare diseases, I think we have some of the same challenges there. We have, um, you know, about we 20 years ago, Congress passed a minor use and minor species bill that, you know, tried to address some of this, understanding that for either a minor species that's not like a cat or dog or cow or a minor use that the incentives for a company to develop a drug and bring a drug to market and manufacture it are not the same. You know, if you've got a cattle drug or dog drug or a cat drug, you've got a pretty big market for that. But if, if we need a drug for honeybees or um, blackhead and turkeys, um, it, the market may not look the same. Got it. And that, that we call it mums and mums has had some successes. It's had some real wins, but I think there's a lot more we want to see out of it. So we, we said, let's put an innovation agenda together that can really punch up both of these issues. How do we really set up these new exciting technologies that hold significant promise for success? And how can we continue to push on some of these areas where we have unmet needs and the system's not working optimally to address those unmet needs. So what, what can FDA do to help the system work better? And so if you look at our innovation agenda, it, it is um, really meant to be a conceptual document. It's got some meat in there and some protein and some specific things, but it's also meant to conceptualize how we want to approach these problems and be a living document. So it's got four pillars which are, you know, we want to support technologies and products that address these high priority needs, which, you know, I've discussed. We want to look at aligning our regulatory pathways to the modern landscape. Um, we want to enhance our One Health 
workforce. And um, we also want to get ahead of what's coming down the track. So we've got a pillar about, you know, identify and address both, you know, new technologies coming down the track and new threats, um, emerging health threats coming down the track. And so we're really trying to put those four pillars into practice and um, much of what we do from a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yeah, let's let's go a little further into some of those, because, um, again, these these topics are, are most of these we've touched on. And I'd like to go, uh, especially the One Health, a little deeper with you, because, again, in the, in the case of uh, what you're doing at CVM, you know, clearly you have to think of this from multiple angles in the sense that, you know, no, uh, we don't want the zoonotic cop to, to humans, uh, but we also don't want it to our companion animals. We want them to be healthy. We want to make sure our food supply doesn't go away based on some nasty uh, zoonotic spillover event. Um, you know, we, we had uh, Dr. Uh, Jacobs Young on from US a couple months ago talking about the you know the new BSL-4 facilities they have and the MBAF. Um, talk a little bit about some of the, sort of the technology here that you uh, think about, that you're excited about in terms of the One Health issue, whether it's, you know, uh, things like, you know, vaccinating the intermediary species. Um, I saw some really interesting part of the agenda that actually had to do with uh, animal cell culture. And this got me thinking a little bit because we've done a few shows on the cell cultured meat stuff uh, that's coming down the pike. Obviously, uh, it's sort of a much broader purview here that you got to think about, but walk us through some of, some of what gets you excited technologically in, in this yeah what well, are you concerned well, about? i think i'll hit technology but first i'll just hit partnership because i think you know uh, having a one health approach means really working with partners to answer these questions and so i think one example i have is you know when 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 h5n1 first emerged in dairy cows one of the first questions fda needed to answer is is the milk safe and does pasteurization work and we needed right. to do a study for that and um and, you know, we had the world's pasteurization and milk experts, but um, USDA Ag Research Service had the world's uh, high path and poultry experts. And so we were able to get that study done quickly, gold standard study, by having our scientists work with USDA's um, poultry and, and HPAI scientists and actually install a pilot scale pasteurizer in their BSL-3 lab down in Athens, Georgia. Okay. So I think, you know, I think we're, we're really constantly trying to, and, and this is a, you know, a tenet of the innovation agenda, take the One Health approach and, and work across expertise, across silos, across agencies to you know, drive quick science-based answers to, to urgent One Health questions. But no, you're right. So a lot of technologies to be exciting about. So you know, we're excited about gene editing and intentional genomic alterations in animals. Um, we've been doing a lot of thinking about a flexible and modern regulatory framework for that area um, that can ensure those products are safe, that they do what they say they they're do, that they're safe if meant for food producing animals, that they're safe for the people that may eat those products. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're we're certainly interested in in animal cellular therapies and in um, like you said, cellular agriculture. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of these technologies are pretty nascent and and new. And it's going to be interesting to see where they go or how fast they go. Um, and then zoo technical um, um, animal food substances, we, we kind of call them ZAFs. But, you know, these are these, you know, novel substances that can be added to food that, you know, only act uh, within the animal's GI tract and might be able to alter their waste products or potentially reduce pathogens. Um, and, you know, one of the things that these collide up against is we've got, you know, our regulatory frameworks, a lot of them date back several decades, and they're not always, you know, totally fit for purpose. And so we do a lot of work to see how can we flex our, our regulatory and, and statutory frameworks to meet um, these new uh, innovative technologies. But we also continually do thinking, are there areas where we may need to work with Congress and partners to actually update some of these authorities so that we you know, stay as the number one place to do innovation, um, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, on the medical side or on the agriculture side or the food production side. I mean, we, we want our industries to be as robust as possible, to produce as many innovations as possible and to get as many approved products out there that are, you know, safe, that are effective. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And on the um, the intentional genomic alterations in animals front, and I know there's also uh, a couple uh, guidance for industries that were just released a couple months ago on uh, sort of the risk based approach that you're you're looking at and the approval processes for some of these. Um, 
uh, again, uh, th there could be a broad range of stuff that it, 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 maybe we don't talk as much about uh, sort of the animal modification as we do maybe touched on plants and so forth. But this this goes a little beyond just food because in under this category, you now also have responsibility uh, for biopharmaceutical products you know, that tra you know, produced in transgenic animals. Um, obviously, we can think about the uh, the odd scenarios of, you know, creating a, A heat resistant cow that can hang out in the Sahara Desert or a, 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 a frost resistant camel that can hang out in the Arctic or, or everything in between. But um, any interesting stories uh, that you could touch on that aren't confidential about some of the stuff that you see come through, I guess, at this level of, uh, of your responsibility? Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we've got a few interesting products already on the, the market. So I think you've, uh, you know, uh, maybe hinted at our the slip cattle um, and we've also got the uh, alpha gal pig. I think the alpha gal pig is an interesting one. I think it really um, symbolizes one health because, you know, so, you know, there's, there's this um, syndrome that has started to, you know, emerge in, in people a number of years ago um, where there would be an allergy developed to things like red meat that could be quite severe. And, Right. you know, it turns out that, um, you know, tick bites, uh, you know, really largely, if you think about it, um, the Lone Star tick, which has got this like white dot on it, but maybe not just that tick, um, can somehow induce um, an, an allergy to this, Uh, carbohydrate, the sugar alpha galactose um, that can be displayed on mammalian cells. And, you know, we've seen an interesting expansion in the range of certain ticks. And there's, I think, interesting questions in, in science about how much of that is a changing climate, um, how much of that is also uh, exploding deer populations. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, this can be a big problem. And so, Um, there was work to look at, you know, editing, a, a, a look at alternative pigs genome, you know, can you uh, knock out essentially the production of this sugar? And, and if you, uh, if you can, um, you know, that can have real um, benefit for medical use, like xenotransplantation, Yeah. as well as for food use, um, for those that might have this alpha gal syndrome. And I mean, to me, that's, you know, like a great story. Like we've got this increasing emerging one health syndrome and, you know, this technology can help provide a solution across both the medical and the, the food and agriculture space. Um, so like cattle is one where we actually used um, enforcement discretion, where we, we said we, we, we need to look at the safety um, and effectiveness of this edit, but maybe not at the same level of a full approval. Um, but really, can you produce a, a, a cow with this, um, you know, slick short coat that can be more heat resistance um, and, and help, you know, those animals fare better in, in hotter climates. And, you know, I, I I think there's just so much more that this technology can be applied to. I mean, certainly on the horizon, you've got people thinking about, can you gene edit coral to better resist warming and acidifying oceans? You know, are there, um, you know, there's a number of, I think, uh, you know, applications, whether you're thinking, therapy and small animals or resiliency and our food system or even potential wildlife applications. So I think it's going to be a technology that's going to be critical. Um, it's a new field and, and, you know, we want the field to be set up to be robust. Um, we've got to think about, are these alterations safe for the animals, safe for the person, if, if it's meant for food production, are they effective? And I think importantly, particularly when you're thinking about editing plants or animals, are they durable? You know, Right. the intention is that in, in these circumstances, which may be different than human um, medical applications, um, we want these edits generally to be durable and passed down to successive generations in a way that's predictable for the, those who own the animals or for the producers who, who raise the animals. Got it. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm glad you brought up xenotransplantation because we, we, we've profiled a couple of those players on the show, and I, I wasn't thinking that. Yeah, you <laughs> clearly you have to be at the table for that uh, whole discussion, not just in the perspective of the genetic engineering, but also One Health, because here we're we're crossing species technically, and uh, but uh, I've always been very surprised at how quickly the uh, Xeno has has uh, has moved along uh, you know, a couple decades ago. So that that's really exciting. Um, You know, just one other area I wanted to touch on because I, I um, 
a couple months ago, yeah, I also had uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kevin uh, Kevin Pugin on the show, uh, you know, talking a little about some of the clinical innovation initiatives at FDA on the human side. You have some related stuff happening in, in terms of some of the, the proposed rules on labeling for both not just approved products, but also conditionally approved animal drugs. And this is a, a very interesting topic. I, I've done a little bit uh, sort of in the, the longevity science space, and there was a, a big announcement a couple of months ago about a company that was uh, moving down that path in terms of new animal drug applications based on conditional approval. Could you walk us through a little bit of that? Because that's something that we don't hear as much about. Maybe we hear maybe a little bit of that on the human side with sort of the last couple of years, but uh, what's happening yeah. in terms of conditional approval per CVM? <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, conditional approval, and, and it's interesting because I had a chance to work on this back in 2018 um, when conditional approval was expanded and what became the 2018 ADUFA. So um, which Animal Drug User Fee Act and Animal Drug Generic User Fee Act. So we, uh, we like many FDA medical product centers have, you know, user fees that support the drug review process, and those are up for Congress every five years. And at the time, I was in FDA's legislative office, um, at, at leading on that effort from the legislative side. Um, so it's been great to now land at at the Center for Veterinary Medicine and see how that's working. But yeah, you know, conditional approval is a pathway, um, and you know, a number of our medical product centers have you know pathways that are sort of in the same vein. And you think about accelerated approval at our human drug center. Um, that was meant to say in areas where we have unmet needs or perhaps for a uh, minor use, minor species, you know, can we have a slightly different uh, risk tolerance? So conditional approval is a pathway that allows, you know, a faster to market um, opportunity where you don't have to produce all of your, your efficacy data um, to get a conditional approval. So if you can show the product is safe and that there's an expectation of, of effectiveness, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think Congress recognized that for areas like unmet needs where there's a serious unmet medical need in veterinary medicine, um, you know, they wanted to give an incentive for developers to bring maybe those harder products to market where the need's really great, you know, not just another um, T and flick, uh, flea and tick med, which are really important, but, you know, we've got a good arsenal of those. And of course we want continued innovation in there, but, you know, if you're really thinking about a cancer drug for a dog, you know, how, how do you get that to market? And so we can do a conditional approval and the sponsors got five years to continue to produce their efficacy data in the real world. And the goal is that most of those products, so long as they can really meet those, you know, get to their efficacy data, can eventually transition to a full approval. And so I think as an example of us and our partners in, in Congress thinking about what are ways that we can incentivize more products to get to market in, you know, harder areas where maybe the trials are going to be really challenging or where there's an unmet need. And I think we want to do more thinking about these types of incentives um, to get our, uh, you know, to get developers to really work in these spaces where we want to see more interventions um, and where maybe we haven't seen as much innovation or approved products as we've ideally wanted to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so in, in addition just in all, all, all these programs and all the responsibilities you have on this front, you have a, a major uh, focus on on education. Uh, obviously, all, all aspects of uh, sort of the public in, in terms of of what you're up to. Um, I know you have some uh, these virtual symposiums coming up. The one that kind of intrigued me was this. I think this is next month. Uh, this one's entitled "Paws, Claws, Hooves, Fins, and Feet: Advancements Through a One Health Approach." Um, a lot of public facing stuff. Very important, obviously, due to the nature of what you do. Um, what's coming up uh, that we should know about in terms of, of other public facing initiatives, conferences, talks uh, that um, you know you're going to be front and center in? Because clearly, uh, as yeah. we've been chatting, CVM is at the epicenter of it all. Well. And I, I have to shamelessly plug, there's so many great things we do, and I feel like we could talk for an hour, but, you know, um, and next week, um, I and the commissioner and, and another of our staff members at the Center for Veterinary Medicine will be out at Colorado State University in Fort Collins doing a visit to talk about One Health, in part to talk about H5N1, but also to visit one of our VetLearn labs. So the Center for Veterinary Medicine has a veterinary lab and investigation response network where we've partnered with a number of 
veterinary college labs or state animal diagnostic labs to help us build a network that's a little bit like our own CDC to like run down emerging issues where maybe an animal is getting sick. Maybe it seems they're getting sick from something they ate. Um, how do we figure out what that is and what's going on? So we have this really excellent network and, and I'm excited to be out there because that lab's also been very involved in helping Colorado stand up a, a testing program for H5 and, and one there. Um, so I think we're, we're you know, going to continue to do some of these visits to our veterinary schools and, and vet learn labs. You mentioned the One Health Symposium, really excited about that. We're actually able to offer continuing education for veterinarians and veterinary technicians this year. So we're excited to, you know, continue to have a public facing conference on One Health and, and FDA's role and CVM's role and to really make it really, I, I think, worthwhile for more practitioners out there in the real world to tune in get some CE, learn more about what we, we do, and hopefully get better connected to how to talk to FDA when they may think that they have an adverse event, or maybe they think they're seeing, you know, something related to animal food safety or, um, you know, how to get in touch with us. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, I think one thing I'll plug is we've engaged our um, foundation, the Reagan Udall Foundation for the FDA, sure. to do a report on the state of the industry. Um, they've set up an expert panel with a number of, of experts, and they're helping us look at all of the things that we've talked about today, particularly in our innovation agenda. What are the opportunities for more innovation? What are the challenges? Where is the system not working optimally? And then bring us some ideas and solutions in this area. And this is a really great way for us to gather expert feedback, external feedback. They've been holding a number of roundtables with our partners. They've got um, something up on their website to take comments, and we're really excited that that report, we, which we are hoping will land sometime this coming spring, will help add to our arsenal of thoughts and ideas on how to move forward these tenets in our innovation agenda. So I would say keep your eye on us, uh, the Center for Veterinary Medicine. We're, we have a lot cooking, um, and I think you'll be seeing a lot from us in the year ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one last thing while I have it, just, I just have to touch on because I, I, I overlooked this, but I just wanted to, if you give me a couple minutes on it. Uh, one of the responsibilities um, that you have there at CVM uh, is the, uh, you mentioned collaborations, but are the international collaborations. And clearly, just like we've known for the last couple of years, the do not spillover doesn't respect borders um a lot of these you know <laughs> these animals can flow around uh, uh quite freely and you know some of the some of what we talked about in terms of the genetic engineering of course you know uh while making a heat resistant cow might not be useful here in the united states may be very useful and uh with our partners abroad um any interesting things you can mention with regard to the international collaboration activities at cvm yeah, so I mean, like like you said, um, One Health is global, and we've got a lot of a lot of things to think about on the international stage. Something we share with uh, many uh, all other parts of FDA is supply chains. We have a number of products or active ingredients or foods that are produced overseas. How do we get a handle on that? How do we, you know, have the right tools and resources to ensure the safety of imported products? And what ways can we work with other um, countries to help us maximize our resources and work together? Um, so um, we've got mutual recognition um, like that we've been working on as other centers have been working on with certain trusted foreign counterparts. Um, and I think we're gonna continue to see challenges to get a handle on global supply chains and really you know, confront you know, how these supply chains work um, and how they can get disrupted when there's um, major events. And then absolutely, we work with a number of our foreign counterparts and international organizations on these meaty um, One Health issues. So certainly during the early days of H5N1, we had a number of um, conversations with international partners who wanted to understand the emergent science we were producing, like our pasteurization validation study. Um, and there's a number of perennial important topics like antimicrobial resistance, where you know, we are constantly talking with um, international partners um, to really figure out what's the right science-based way to address these issues. And, you know, these things are complicated because you're right, pathogens and animals don't always know boundaries. Um, but, you know, it's public health systems, production systems, food systems can look very different um, in different countries. And, you know, how do you 
you know, set, you know, appropriate goals and work together, but also make sure that, you know, what you want to do makes sense um, um, in very different places with different types of industries and climates and, and regulatory systems. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the AMR issue because that's been a very, I know everyone's calling it a silent pandemic, but it's uh, it's not very silent and it's coming fast and furious. And again, I'm glad that's something that you uh, you keep your eye on, especially to the dual nature of uh, of the uh, the customers that you look at here. So uh, no, very, very important work. Um, again, uh, I'm really excited uh, about the innovation plan. I'm excited about everything that you and your team are up to. Um, any final messages for the audience? And uh, what type of pets do you you have just offhand i mean I... no so i um i actually don't have a pet right now oh, um, i right. used to have um, a, a cat and i probably will have uh be getting another cat um sometime soon yeah. um but uh yeah i i you know i would say you know the, the center for veterinary medicine i think is becoming more and more important as we see more of these one health challenges and so i would you know, really encourage your audience to keep their eye on fda to keep their eye on the center for veterinary medicine um, we've got a lot of challenges ahead, but we've also got a lot of exciting opportunities and we're really excited to see where veterinary medicine can go. And I know we spent a lot today talking on wildlife and one health and food production because those I think really impact um, our systems, our resiliency, our food security, but there's a lot of innovative work going to drive forward new treatments to um, problems that pet owners have. You know, my, 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 my cat um, who, had atopic dermatitis, you know, a really difficult um, disease to manage. And, and we've been improving, you know, new products in that area. And we know that there's an increased interest in cancer treatments for small yep. animals. And so I don't want it to be lost that part of this innovation agenda is also about driving forward new innovative treatments for people's pets, you know, really for, for cats and dogs, certainly, because we know consumers really care more and more about their animals. They're integral parts of the family. Um, there's an increased interest in specialized care in veterinary medicine and to really have the most robust specialized care. You know, we want to bring to bear more approved products that are safe, that are effective, um, that can help treat these, these issues that can cause disease and, and suffering and difficulty in, in our pets and, you know, bring more innovations to, to bear in that space. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and just a note, I, I, uh, my bird was once depressed, so we had to put him on Prozac, but yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> and I, I would pay anything for it. So yeah, there's, uh, <laughs> but no, no re really awesome work, Tristan. And, and I, and I just so appreciate you spending the time and, and taking us through a little sampling of everything you're up to. Um, again, for everybody that's, uh, going to be listening to, uh, this episode across the various podcast networks or who will be watching on our YouTube channel, Again, you've been spending time with Dr. Tristan Kalanias, Chief Veterinary Officer and Deputy Director for Silence Policy at the FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine, where he's executing on their strategy and uh, goals of protecting both human and animal health. Uh, Tristan, again, thank you so much for taking the time out of the schedule. Uh, thank you for everything you do. And as we like to say on our show, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow, not just for us, but for all our furry friends. Um, really an awesome story. Yeah, thanks, Ira. This was a great conversation and maybe I can come back in a few years and update you on what we've accomplished. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Thanks.